Faith and diplomacy. You can't think of two things more further apart. One is rooted in culture and belief. The other is all about logic and hard calculations. Yet they have always intersected. India has been trying to perfect this powerful cocktail. How? By using its ancient ties with Buddhism. New Delhi is currently hosting a very important event, the Global Buddhist Summit. And the attendance is impressive. 30 foreign ambassadors, 171 foreign delegates, and 150 Indian Buddhist organizations. The idea is not just to showcase the values of Buddhism, because those are already common knowledge. The idea is to marry those values with present challenges. Whether it's war and aggression, or sustainable growth, or technological progress. Prime Minister Narendra Modi delivered an address on the first day of the summit. He said that Buddha's teachings offer solutions to world problems. Listen to this. Aadhunik vishwa ki aisi koi samasya nahi hai jiska samadhan saikdo varsh pahle buddha ke upadesho mein hume praapta na hua ho. Aad dunia जिस युद्ध और शांति से पीड़ित है बुद्ध ने सदियों पहले इसका समाधान दिया था नाउ दिस इज अ बुद्धिस्ट गैदरिंग सो द ऑब्वियस क्वेश्चन इज वेयर इज द वर्ल्ड्स टॉप बुद्धिस्ट लीडर द दलाई लामा ही इज एक्सपेक्टेड टू अटेंड डे 2 ऑफ द समिट दैट्स टुमारो एंड रेस्ट अशोर्ड चाइना विल ब्लो अ फ्यूज इन 2011 द दलाई लामा हैड एड्रेस्ड अ सिमिलर गैदरिंग इन न्यू दिल्ली एंड बीजिंग वाज फ्यूरियस दे कैंसिल बॉर्डर टॉक्स विद इंडिया सून आफ्टर सो एक्सपेक्ट अ सिमिलर टेंट्रम टुमारो द चाइनीज आर लाइक द ग्रिंच ड्यूरिंग क्रिसमस ए दे वोंट अटेंड द समिट देमसेल्व्स एंड बी दे वोंट लेट द दलाई लामा अटेंड इट आइदर नॉट अ सिंगल चाइनीज मंक हैज कम टू न्यू दिल्ली यू सी देयर आर टू बैटल्स प्लेइंग आउट हियर one is over the dalai lama and tibet and the second is over the larger buddhist world who gets to lead and shape that world india or china that is the contest now first let me tell you why this battle is important buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world around 500 million people practice it countries like cambodia thailand bhutan sri lanka and laos are buddhist majority others like south korea and malaysia have a sizable buddhist population now notice where these countries are located. Southeast and Eastern Asia, the same region that China wants to dominate. It tells you why a communist atheist regime like China suddenly loves Buddhism. The problem is, China's Buddhism is political. It's about narrative, not faith. It's linked to controlling and dominating the Tibetan population. Hence the problem with the Dalai Lama and by extension the problem with India. For Beijing, Buddhism is the means to an end. And that end is appointing its own successor to the Dalai Lama. What about India? For New Delhi, the Dalai Lama isn't just a religious leader, he's also a strategic leverage. In 2011, the Dalai Lama was invited to speak despite protests from China. Same in 2023, the Dalai Lama has been invited despite the expected blowback. India, and that's one part of India's calculations, but the second one is equally important. Yes, the Buddha was born in modern-day Nepal, but he lived most of his life in India. His first sermon was in India, his enlightenment, even his final days. And that's something New Delhi can capitalize on, basically brand itself as the cradle and home of Buddhism. How do you do that? by boosting religious tourism, exchanging scholars and students, investing in Buddhist organizations abroad. In a nutshell, do what China can't do. Generate goodwill. The government is already working in this direction. In 2016, the Buddhist Circuit Project was announced. It follows the path of the Buddha. Starts off in Lumbini, heads to Bodh Gaya and Bihar, then Sarnath, Kushinagar and so on. 21 states are covered in this circuit. It already has four international airports and two domestic ones. The next step, of course, is to market it, to make it known to the Buddhist world, to get millions of Buddhists to visit India, because nothing influences policies like people. Our world order is undergoing big changes, and they're not necessarily for the better. Our world is becoming more dangerous. Two powers are in a race, the United States and China, and they're ramping up their weapon stockpiles. They're arming themselves with more dangerous weapons and more nuclear weapons. We are entering a new strategic era, one that will be defined by the great, this great power contest. 
The risk of conflict is higher than ever before. I'll show you how, and we'll start with China. The PLA is eyeing a new weapon, a drone. It will be used to snoop on rivals. The Chinese military is amassing all kinds of spying tools these days. First the balloons, then a base in the Antarctic, we told you about it yesterday, and now the drones. The Americans say they pose a threat. They ordered a secret military assessment. China's new drones will fly at supersonic speeds, they say, at least three times the speed of sound. The drones have more capabilities, including a cutting-edge surveillance system. This will relay real-time data. How can this help the PLA? Such capabilities can be the difference between victory and defeat in war. Using this data, the PLA's generals can make real-time decisions. They can order missile strikes and strike with precision. Reports say the PLA has already established a unit for this drone, the supersonic drone. It falls under their Eastern Theatre Command. And where will China deploy these supersonic drones? Taiwan is a clear target. These drones can help China target American warships around Taiwan, even the military bases in the region. So drones are a clear worry. But there's a bigger threat, and that is nuclear weapons. China wants more nukes, and it wants them fast. Xi Jinping seems determined he wants to close the gap with America. So he has ordered an expansion plan. China has about 410 nuclear warheads today. By the end of this decade, this number could grow to 1,000 warheads. And by 2035, China could end up with 1,500 nukes. This will bring them close to America's stockpile. How many nuclear weapons does the U.S. have? In 2021, it had around 3,750 nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads. These include both active and inactive warheads. China wants to catch up for obvious reasons. It wants to use these nuclear weapons as deterrents to keep America away from Taiwan. And it's speeding up the production of these weapons. It is now building a new reactor in Fujian. This reactor will deliver plutonium. What's plutonium? A radioactive chemical used to make atom bombs. So China has conveyed its intentions. It has started a new nuclear race. And the U.S. plans to not be left behind. It has plans to modernize its nuclear arsenal. Washington will spend $2 trillion on this, $2 trillion on nuclear weapons. This money will not be spent in one go. The U.S. plans to spend $2 trillion over 30 years to completely upgrade their nuclear triad. What's a nuclear triad? It basically means the ability to launch nuclear strikes from land, sea, and air. That's a triad. America can do all three. And now it is upgrading these weapons. It is responding to a two-front challenge, the threat from China and the threat from Russia. Because Russia too rem remains a player, Russia too is developing new nuclear systems. In February, Moscow refused to honor the START Treaty with the US. The START Treaty placed limits on nukes. It came into force in the 1990s. The US and Russia decided to cut back on their nukes after the fall of the Soviet Union and also allow inspections on nuclear sites. That's what they agreed to. Those were some of the key commitments, but Russia has suspended its participation. So the world is now in a three-way arms race, the US, China, and Russia. And this race is more dangerous than the Cold War era. There were just two major nuclear powers then. Now there are three. And this is alarming, not just for these three countries, but for the rest of the world too, because this could lead to a trickle-down effect. How would a country like India read the nuclear buildup in China? This is a threat to India too. If China can target America with nukes, it can do the same across the Himalayas. Now let's turn our attention to Russian President Vladimir Putin. He visited the front lines this week, parts of eastern Ukraine that Russia has taken over. He was seen dressed in a heavy blue jacket descending from a military helicopter, greeting senior commanders. But was it really Putin? Ukraine says it was a body double. And frankly, this debate is not new. Putin has been at the center of such speculation for a while now. People analyze his ears, his wrinkles, his fingers, and conspiracy theories flood the internet. But then again, Putin is not the only one. Many leaders have been accused of using political decoys. They're individuals with strong physical resemblance to the person they impersonate. Who are these leaders and why do they need a body double? Here's a report. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin visited the war zone in Ukraine this week. It was his second trip since the war in Ukraine began. So it's a big deal. But for Kyiv, something else is even bigger. They say Putin was never in Ukraine because he was using a body double. And this only renewed such conspiratorial claims because this debate is not new. In fact, only last month, Putin's body double was rumored to appear. Reports say he has an entire team of them. And such claims of Putin using body doubles have surely increased, especially since last February. That's when the war in Ukraine began. But he's not the only leader who's said to have used body doubles. In February, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky was accused too. Apparently, he used a double while meeting US President Joe Biden, who, by the way, has been accused of this too. People claim he used one while receiving a COVID vaccine. So according to rumors, many leaders use political decoys. The list is long. It includes North Korea's Kim Jong-un, USSR leader Joseph Stalin, the late Queen of Britain, Queen Elizabeth, and even the late Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein. And these conspiracy theories only get wilder. Reports say the political decoys often use plastic surgery. But some things can still give them away. For starters, the height. Then gestures and body language, because they are unique for every person. And then, earlobes. Yes, ears are a good identifier. Here's a fun fact. Since the 1950s, ear measurements have been used by forensic scientists. They can help in identifying suspects of crime. And today, ears have become an even bigger identifier than fingerprints. So experts are now comparing Putin's earlobes across the years. But it's not confirmed if Putin ever used a decoy. Some others haven't been so lucky. Like the former US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. His political aide said that Kissinger used an impersonator. For most cases, there is no real proof. However, speculation on the matter seems irresistible. These theories continue to enthrall the masses. They correlate with rumors of leader illnesses. Some even say leaders use body doubles to escape capture, like Osama bin Laden and Hitler. But these rumors continue with little to back them up. That being said, it's unclear if body doubles will even be useful in the future. Because this is a time when young ABBA appeared on stage in a holographic avatar. And during an election rally in France last year, Jean-Luc Mélenchon appeared in 11 cities simultaneously, again through a hologram. So technology is clearly moving on. For aspiring Putin doubles, their career prospects may be limited. Every day we bring you news of conflicts, economic, military and political. Why do they matter? Because they impact our lives. Also because they appear more dramatic and more urgent. Would you put a heat wave in the same category? Because we have. A deadly heat wave is silently killing lives and livelihoods and impacting more people than we care to acknowledge. The numbers are scary. Almost half of India's workers work outdoors. They are at risk. The loss in GDP is monumental. Even Nepal and China are reporting temperatures above 40 degrees. People are dying. This is not a weather story anymore. It is hurting your health. It is hurting your body and the economy of your country. If you're watching us from Asia, you already know what I'm talking about. Look at this map. From India to Bangladesh, Thailand, even eastern China, they're all red. In most of these cases, temperatures are shooting above 40 degrees. Records are being broken. And India is among the worst affected. Over 90% of India is experiencing a severe heat wave. And we are only in the month of April. The worst may be yet to come. But already people are dying because of the heat. Many cities are reporting record temperatures. This week, India's meteorological department issued a heat wave alert. Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, Sikkim, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, these states saw extreme heat. Prayagraj recorded the maximum temperature. Prayagraj is in India's Uttar Pradesh. It's the country's largest state. Earlier this week, it was reporting temperatures above 44 degrees Celsius. In some cities, schools have been closed. On Sunday, 11 people died in Maharashtra and scores needed medical help. Do you know what happened there? There was a government event. It was held outdoors. The attendees were sitting under the scorching sun and this led to dehydration, even death. It is so hot that staying outside may put your life at risk. 
But many Indians don't have a choice. Look at this statistic. Around 49% of Indian workers work outdoors. That translates to over 230 million workers. 23 crore people in India work outdoors. They have no choice but to suffer the scorching heat. And this could be dangerous. Experts have raised an alarm. Indians are extremely vulnerable to heat waves, they say. The soaring temperatures can lead to health risks and food shortages. According to one estimate, 90% of India's population could be at risk. That's more than 1 billion people. And they could be adversely affected by heat waves. This is not a recent trend, though. Heat waves have been taking lives in India for decades now. Again, I have some data. Since 1992, over 24,000 people have died in India. Extreme heat took these lives, 24,000. And it could be worse in the future. Extreme heat could impact every aspect of our lives. 90% of India's total area now lies in extreme heat danger zones. There will be loss of productivity. Extreme heat could lead to 15% decline in outdoor working capacity. It will reduce the quality of life. 480 million people are vulnerable. Even India's economic growth is under threat. By 2050, 2.8% of India's GDP could be lost because of the heat. So the impact will be on both lives and livelihoods, and India won't be the only country to suffer. The entire Asian region is at risk. Look at Thailand. Last week, the heat wave there turned brutal. Temperatures soared to 45 degrees. This is a new national heat record for Thailand. In Bangladesh, temperatures soared above 40 degrees. That was the temperature in Dhaka. Last Saturday was the hottest for Bangladesh in 58 years. In some areas, roads were melting. It was that hot. Even China is suffering. On Monday, 12 Chinese provinces made new records. They reported their highest temperatures for the month of April. Maximiliano Herrera is a weather historian, and he's been tracking this heat wave, and this is what he says. This, and I'm quoting, this is the worst April heat wave in Asian history. The worst ever. If the trend continues, more records could be broken. Our world faces numerous threats, unresolved conflicts, terrorism, pandemics, life-threatening, dangerous shortages. It is time to add climate change to that list. Extreme heat is proving to be a silent killer. And we know world leaders disagree on most things. Perhaps they can agree on this one. Now to Taiwan, it wants people to learn English and it's ready to spend almost a billion dollars to push for it. The government says it wants to make Taiwan bilingual and it has set a deadline for this, the year 2030. This money, the billion dollars, will be spent over the next five years. Why do, what do people in Taiwan speak right now? Mostly Mandarin Chinese. And why does Taipei want to switch to English to boost the economy? You see, whether we like it or not, English is the global language of business. One-fifth of the world speaks it, so it makes sense to do business in a language that most people understand. Earlier, Taiwan's trade largely depended on China, so they did not really need English. But now, with tensions rising, the commerce is also being limited, and Taiwan is heavily dependent on trade. Its economy is worth $829 billion, and about a third of this depends on exports. High-tech hardware exports. So promoting a language that facilitates business is essential. It makes sense. Taiwan sees multiple benefits from its switch to English. It will help domestic companies do well abroad. It will attract more foreign investments and tourists. And it will make Taipei more competitive. Who are they competing with? Other Asian economic powers like Hong Kong, Singapore, the Philippines, and India. All former colonies and all with a large number of English speakers. In fact, Hong Kong is trilingual. They speak English, Mandarin, and Cantonese. It's a byproduct of Hong Kong's complicated legacy, but definitely a boon when it comes to business. Then we have Singapore. It got independence in the year 1965, and since then, it has promoted English as its main language. Again, this was for economic purposes, and the results are evident. Next on our list is the Philippines. It was colonized by the U.S. After independence in 1946, Manila stuck to English. And then there's India. The story is a bit more complicated here. Only about 10% of India knows English. But considering India's population, it's a pretty big number. India has the second largest English-speaking population in the world. It's a massive market that foreign firms want to tap into. Also a source of English-speaking labor. 
although our relationship with English is complicated, and this could be true for all former colonies. English is both a reminder of colonial oppression and a route to upward mobility. The oppression part is obvious, but the language has allowed some, some of us to thrive economically. The go-to example in India is a list of Indian origin CEOs helming U.S. giants, Microsoft Satya Nadella, Google Sundar Pichai, Indra Nui, Ajay Banga, Shantanu Narayan. It's a long list, and no matter how good their other skills are, which are obviously good, they wouldn't be there if they did not know how to speak English. Most people and their governments know this. Around the world, countries work on their English language proficiency to attract businesses and investment. Even countries with no history of British rule. I'll give you an example. At least 85% of the people in all Scandinavian countries speak English. Most mainland European nations have a sizable proportion of English speakers. So Taiwan's policy is not novel in any way. But their timeline, we say, is ambitious. Seven years to teach English to millions of people is unheard of. Even Singapore, with a century and a half of British rule, took decades to make most citizens English speakers. So Taiwan's goal is a tough one to achieve, especially with the dragon breathing fire and threatening war. We wish them luck. Our next story takes me back to a poem. It's by the Soviet poet Boris Slutsky. And this is what it says. It's not even humiliating. In fact, it's rather fun watching our rhymes deflate like foam as greatness retreats solemnly into logarithms. Do you know when this was written? In 1959, he was talking about the defeat of poets at the hands of engineers. And today it seems unintentionally prophetic. Because robots are coming for your poems, paintings, and music. In fact, they're already here. The world of art is living with artificial intelligence or AI. And this week, we heard the future of music. Let's just say it was scary good. We are talking about Heart on My Sleeve, a song made by AI. It cloned the voices of famous artists, Drake and The Weeknd. But here's the catch. There was no real way to tell that it's a fake. And it sounded like a complete hit. So obviously, the song exploded. It garnered millions of views on YouTube, Spotify, and other platforms. And now it has been removed. Some are looking at this as a minor nuisance. Others call it harmless mimicry. But for most of us, it points to something more serious. Is AI the harbinger of headaches for the world of music? And also for art in general? Look at this photograph. It's very good. It's also very fake. This is also AI-generated work. It was submitted in a photography contest recently. It won the award, but the artist declined it. He said it would be unfair to do so. I wanted to see if uh, competitions are prepared for AI images to be handed in, and uh, they are not. It's very um, important that they are aware that um, there will be more and more AI generated images in photo competitions and it should not be mixed up. But let alone competitions, is the world prepared for AI in art? We are currently at an inflection point. Names like ChatGPT, Bard and Midjourney come to mind. And they have come a long way. It's not just about nerdish fascination anymore. Common people like you and me are using these AI tools. They're creeping into our lives and flooding the internet. Remember when Jay-Z rabbed Shakespeare? Or when the Pope was seen wearing a Balenciaga puffer jacket? This is creative and it's good humor, but it's also scary because our fear remains the same. Can AI do a better job than the artists it is imitating? It turns out art faster and its tech is improving. Soon, differences between real and AI-generated art could become indistinguishable. Experts say using AI is a violation of an artist's creativity and personhood. Lazy artists may use AI, and it may even infringe upon livelihoods. So we will say what we've always said. Even if creativity must not be curtailed, AI needs more guardrails in place. And even if policies take their own sweet time, we can relax a little, because art remains somewhat isolated from artificial intelligence. I find human drawings more appealing, precisely because they are messy. 
When you see drawings by a traditional artist, sometimes the hand is disproportionately big. But because it is disproportionate, it looks appealing. There is no risk of artists being replaced by artificial intelligence because the creative act is the most human of all acts, which comes from an intention and therefore from consciousness which comes from something that artificial intelligences are very, very far from having at the moment. Think about it. The enjoyment of art is reliant on humanity. We don't love music because it is a digitized accumulation of chords and lyrics. We love it because it comes from a human being. It is inspired by their experiences, their ideas. Like when Rihanna's song said, nobody text me in a crisis, we felt that. Or when Taylor Swift sang about her relationships, a lot of people could relate because we connect with the artist. It's true that AI fakes today are merely a sideshow. There is much more to come. But AI will continue to be a sideshow in the real world of art. We say true genius will beat the algorithm every time. So we agree when, when Slutsky said, it's not even humiliating. In fact, it's rather fun. The US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the Colonial Loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting.